Today, we're actually going to be start reading the Revelations chapter 12 and 13. And as I said before, I believe it's my job to make you think as we read the scriptures together. And tonight, we're going to do a lot of thinking. Um, and I pray that the Holy Spirit that dwells in you will reveal the truth of God's word to you so that you and you will know and understand it, what God's plan really is for your life, your life specifically. So before we begin, let's please bow our heads with me and let's open up our Bible study with a prayer to our creator and our savior. So Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all that is seen and unseen. Tonight, I just ask you to, to dump your wisdom upon us, open up our eyes so that we can see your truth, open up our hear, ears so that we can hear your word that you have left behind for thousands and thousands of years for us to study and to understand. So tonight, Father, we know there's going to be some mystery and we know there's a lot of symbolism. We just ask you to clarify what needs to be clarified through the Holy Spirit. And we just ask you in this, in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I mentioned in the prayer, we are going to review some symbolism today. And it's going to be a little confusing at times. And I just recommend that we don't focus too much on the details so that we don't lose the, the grand scale of the vision that God has left behind for us to read and understand to the best of our ability, the best of this fleshly body, that ability. So as we are human beings, we should understand that some of the details are a mystery and they will remain a mystery until we see Jesus in person. So tonight, we're not going to we're not going to have a crystal clear vision of everything that we go over in, Gen in Genesis, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 12 and 13. So with that said, though, I want to start today by showing you a series of slides and reveal material that we already covered, but also to set the stage for our lesson in the great book of Revelation today. So I'm going to turn around and share a slide with you. And... We're going to go through a series of slides. And this one I've shown before. And what I really want to focus here is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And we're going to talk about the three world ages again um, in tonight's. And we know that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and Satan was there before what? The first earth age. And when we talk about the first earth age, we're going to talk about before the foundations of the world in tonight's study. So I wanted you just to remind, hey, there was a world before our world was created in Genesis. That's the second earth age. So that's the world that we live in. This is the battleground of good and evil. And of course, our goal is to be in the third earth age, which would be the world yet to come. When Jesus returns Revelation 19 and gives us the new heaven and earth, which is discussed in Revelation 21. This is eternity. Everything that we do here on earth, that's our goal. We want to be there one day. So I wanted to show you this, but again, we're going to be reading about the election and before the foundations of the world. And I just want to let you or show this uh, slide to you once again. And then I'm going to show you another slide about the tribulation period in itself. Okay. I don't spend a lot of time and energy so far devoting to timing out the events for you. Um, but I'd rather spend the time and energy for you to spiritually look at what it, you need to do to be prepared for these events. But this kind of gives us a, a broad picture. Um, the tribulation, uh, Revelation chapter six through 10, those are the first three and a half years. If you look at the book of Daniel, there's a seven years and then there's a split. One is gonna be the first three and a half years. Well, we already went through that in, ver in chapter six through 10. And then we're gonna have the mid, midpoint and that's the great tribulation that's where it gets really intensified and that's where we are now revelations chapters 11 and 18 so this is the second three and a half years we introduced that in our study last week when we had the two witnesses in chapter 11 so that was kind of the beginning of that and of course we'll have armageddon and jesus coming in revelation 19 but i just kind of wanted to give you a quick picture of where we are in our study tonight we're in chapters 12 and 13 and I want to show you this one again, but I added a few things. So this was the triangle. And inside the triangle, you have us. And you have planet Earth. You have you, me, others. We talked about government, religion, finance, and education. But what I added this time is, just like we have the Trinity, we have God, we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit. 
Over here, you have Satan. And tonight, we're going to talk about the first beast, which is the Antichrist. And we're also going to talk about the second beast, which is the false prophet. So you can see they also have their own somewhat of a trinity, the three of them. And what's the goal of Satan in all these things? Well, he wants to what? Dominate Mother Earth. He wants to dominate you. He wants to dominate me. He wants to dominate others. He wants to get involved in us so that we will denounce Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and he can steal our soul. We know that he's going to go into government. We're going to talk about potentially how he's going to create a one world government. You know he's going to be in the religion, the religious industry. He's going to then have eventually one religion throughout the world. He's going to be using money against us. We're going to talk about how we can only sell or buy goods by what? Taking the mark of the beast. We're going to go over that tonight. And of course, they're going to redo all this education. So we're going to go and, and I just wanted to point this out to you. His job, and that's all that he wants to do, is dominate this world and everybody in it so that he can steal their souls. That's his only, only motivation. And he does that and thinks about it every day, every minute of every day. He's persistent. So then I wanted to go in here and we're going to talk about some of the efforts to destroy Jesus, the, 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 uh, the Messiah. So this was when Satan, this is only some of them, not all of them, but this is a reminder that Satan has been after Jesus from the beginning. So in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, verse 16 reads, and this is a reminder for you guys and gals, but Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Verse 17, Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, which is, a cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great moaning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. This is when he, King Herod, dominated by the devil, sent out his troops to kill all the babies two years and younger. Remember that? He was trying to get what? Baby Jesus. So I'm going to take, show you a couple of other times where Satan, we can see his efforts to try to destroy Jesus. Number two, Matthew chapter four, verse one. Then Jesus led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. But we know that Jesus overcame the temptation of Satan during that time frame. And number three, Judas' betrayal. So in, in the Gospel of John, same author that is in the author of Revelation, John 13, chapter 2, it says, During supper, this is the last supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Jews, Judas Iscariot. So the devil is working in the last supper. And he got into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, betray Jesus. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. He didn't want Jesus to exist because he wanted to control the world forever and ever. So he knew that Jesus was standing in his way. And of course, number four, the cross. Jesus surrendered his life on the cross in order to beat death and Satan. Okay, so these are some of the, the areas where Satan himself tried to take care of Christ before he became the Messiah to be ascended into heaven to see, be seated at the right hand of the Father. So now we're going to pick it up. We're going to end chapter 12 in the great book of revelation we're going to pick it up with verse one and verse one reads and a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and her head a crown of 12 stars so this is typically referencing the nation of israel and of course the 12 stars would be the 12 tribes verse two and she was with child and she cried out, being in labor, in pain to give birth. So what is she doing? She's giving birth to a whole new age, a whole new world through who? 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah, through what? The tribe of Judah. That is the line where Jesus comes from. So a whole new earth age is being born. Verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and seven or and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diamonds. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the details of what this represents, because what it remembers what represents nations, rulers, wisdom, authority, power. And we're going to see the first and second beast have something similar. These aren't monsters coming out, but these are all symbolisms of what the future one world government will look like, what the one ruler will look like. And so that's kind of where the symbolism of this is occurring. I'm not going to talk about which country and what nation is going to be the super dominant power. It doesn't matter for our salvation. Okay. Remember, the one biggest sign that you will see is when the two witnesses appear. That will be an undeniable sign that the second half of the three and a half years has begun, the Great Tribulation. So all these other signs, I'm not going to waste a lot of energy to go down that road because at the end of the day, it's not going to prepare you to the road, to the successful journey and the road of salvation. So I'm going to continue with verse four. And his tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So God is evicting Satan from heaven. Okay, he's no longer going to be in heaven. He's no longer be allowed. You remember the book of Job? Remember the story? He was going actually into the court of God himself, and, and God asked him, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and from earth to heaven. And he, was, he, he said, did you check out on my guy named Job? So he has that ability, but no more will he have the ability to be in the presence of God in heaven. He's just been kicked out of heaven. And what is he going to do? He's going to be enraged, and he's going to create havoc. And his intensity to persecute the world is going to be enhanced. So now we have verse 5. And she gave birth to a son, a male child. This is baby Jesus. This is the Christ. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. This is our King. Okay. Who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. What's he going to do? That doesn't sound like the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, does it? What's Jesus' ultimate job? It said to what? Rule all the nations with a rod of iron and her child and caught up to God and his throne. We know he ascended to be seated at the right hand of the Father. I want to take you, just go to chapter 19 in Revelation, verse 15. I want to just kind of follow up on this rod of iron. Revelation 19, verse 15. Just a couple of pages away. 19, I'm just going to read verse 15. And from his mouth, talking about Jesus, from the mouth of Jesus comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, El Shaddai. So I just wanted to link those, okay? I just wanted to link that rod of iron because that's how Jesus himself is going to rule. So going back to chapter 12, and we're going to pick it up with verse 6. So again, I just want to link. We always look at Jesus in modern times as what? The Lamb of God, the one who did the sacrifice. But he's going to come back as what? The Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and he's going to rule. And he's going to get rid of all the evil in the world. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Where she had a place prepared by God. Don't miss that. God is actually preparing a place of protection for her. You see that? A place prepared by God 
so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. So Satan's kicked out of the heaven. He's coming after the woman who's going to give birth. And God himself is going to protect her in the wilderness. Verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. And again, it's hard to figure out all these timings of everything. Past, present, future. When they are. But they're not in chronological order. So you have to kind of go through them. But they're obviously important because God left them for us to read and to try to understand to our best of our fleshly ability. But verse seven, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. We know the dragon is Satan. So Michael, the Ark to England is having what? A war in heaven with Satan himself, the accuser. And the dragon and his angels waged war. And where's the war at this point in time? It's in heaven. Later, it's going to be on earth, Armageddon. But right now, we're talking about heaven. And verse 8 says, And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And again, this is when Satan is going to be evicted from heaven from God. Okay. And you remember in chapter 8? In chapter 8, remember there was a half hour silence in heaven? In chapter 8 in book of Revelation, it could be linked to this. When God evicted after this war and God evicted Satan out of heaven and all the other angels, the, the demon angels, that could have been that 30 minutes, that half hour of silence in heaven. And that's documented in Revelation chapter 8. I'm not saying it's linked, but it could be. So now we go, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. So again, God evicted Satan. He threw him down. And what is Satan going to do? It gives us a glimpse of what he's going to do right here. He says what? It's going to deceive part of the world, half of the world. Oh, it says the whole world in my version. Does it say that in your version as well? The whole world. And his angels were thrown down with him. And you remember in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, Jesus also commented in, in chapter 10, verse 18, that he saw Jesus and the angels fall. Okay, and that's documented in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. So now we're in Revelation, chapter 10. And it reads, and I heard a loud voice in heaven. So Apostle John just hears this loud voice in heaven. And it's saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, Jesus, have come for the accuser of our brethren. Who's the accuser? Satan. Who's the brethren? Brethren all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, the believers, okay? So he says, Christ have come. So that's the second coming, projecting it out in the near future. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. Who accuses them before our God day and night? So what was Satan doing before? He always coming back to God and say, hey, what about this person? What about this person? Always accusing them not being a true believer. Not being faithful to God, being rebellious to God. He would accuse them of them, uh, of people, as he roamed the earth. He said, no longer is that the case. Verse 11, and they overcame him. Who overcame him? God, the angels, and the brethren. 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. So because Jesus went on the cross and died for us, and spilled his blood, that is one of the reasons, or it is the reason, why we are able to overcome Satan's deception. Okay? And what else did it say? And because of the word of their testimony, they were always quick to talk about what Jesus did with 
their life after they accepted him as Lord and Savior, after they surrendered their own life to him. So they were actually witnesses by sharing their testimony. And that's what also helped them become what? Overcomers. Okay, read that again. In a land, because of the word of their testimony, so they're speaking God's word, being witnesses of what Jesus has done for them. And they did not love, here's the kicker, ladies and gentlemen, this is probably our biggest challenge for ourselves and everybody else. It says, and they did not love their life even to death. That's verse 11. So ladies and gentlemen, we, you and I, and everybody else who profess to be a Christ follower, we should be like Christ and what? Not love our life on this earth so much that we won't give our own life back to him, back to God. Because there's going to be a point, we're going to read about it, that there's going to be a point where we must take the mark of the beast. And if we don't take the mark of the beast, what's going to happen to our life? It's going to be ended. But if we love our life so much here on earth, guess what we might do? We might take the mark and worship the Christ, the Antichrist, and not the real Christ. And that won't go good, Judgment Day. So there we have it. Do not love their life even to death. These are the successful Christians right here. This is what they did. They were witnesses, and they didn't love their life even unto death. Verse 12. For this reason, because they did this, because they were witnesses, to the testimony of Jesus, and because they didn't love their life here on earth more than the, the life that they would love in eternity with God. Because of this, what does it say? For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you will dwell in them. You will dwell in heaven. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So the devil knows he only has a short period of time. So what's he going to do? He's going to ramp it up. The intensity level is going to increase tremendously. And that's why this is called the what? The Great Tribulation. The second half of the three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. Because that's where all the woes, the three woes are coming down on us. Okay? The intensity is going to pick up. Verse 13. And when the dragon, Satan, saw that he was thrown down to the earth, Almost like he was surprised, according to this verse. He was, when he noticed, he was thrown down. Well, that's his pride. That's his arrogance. Like, I got kicked out of heaven? So it says, and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Verse 14. And the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. This is the place that what? God created for her to protect her and the child. So that the child would live to ultimately go on to the what? The cross, the sacrifices life to give us the grace and the opportunity for hope of the eternal security. So he says, fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and a half of a time from the present presence of the serpent, protected from Satan for a period of time. God knows what he's doing. And this is in the wilderness. Verse 15. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. He's not giving up, isn't he? This is all he does every minute of the day, figuring out how he can take control of the world once and for all for eternity and how to get your soul. This is all he does. So what does he do? He spews out this river, hoping that to take the woman and her child. Verse 16, and the earth... This is a living, breathing earth that we're on. Does it not feed us every day? 
Does it not feed the birds? It's a living, breathing earth. And what does the earth do on the command of God? Look at verse 16. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. God's got our back. And Mother Earth is helping. Verse 17. And the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. With the rest of her offspring. I'm going to come back to that. Who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. They're actually Jesus followers. They know the commandments and they're following the teachings of who? Of Jesus. But let's go back to this offspring. What did it say? He's going to make war with the rest of her offspring. Ladies and gentlemen, remember I started this off with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? Remember the curse after the fruit was taken and sin was entered into the world by Adam and Eve? And the curse of God came and he went to the serpent first. Remember that? And he said, I will create hostility or enmity between your seed and his seed or his seed and her seed. You remember that? Genesis 3.15, if you don't. What's happening right here, ladies and gentlemen? Satan. Let's read it again. He's so mad, he went off to make war with the rest of her seed. Just pause on that a little bit. It was given to us in Genesis 3.15. Satan has his own seed line. And Christ, of course, has his own scene line. And ever since then, there was what? A battle of good and evil ever since Genesis 3. And it got so bad that in the times of Noah, God, what? Wiped out the earth except for eight people because it got so wicked, so evil because of Genesis 3.15 that he wanted to start over. So that concludes chapter 12. I'm going to pick it up with chapter 13, verse 1. And this is now the beast coming from the sea. Verse one reads, and he stood on the sand of the sea source. So this is beast number two. Remember the first beast is going to be the Antichrist. The second beast is going to be the false prophet. So and he stood on the sand of the sea source. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having 10 horns and seven heads on his horns were the ten diem, diadems, and on his head were blasphemous names. So, verse 2 here, the beast again is a person. Okay, he's not a monster with all these heads, right? He's a person. And matter of fact, this person, the false prophet, is going to be handsome, just like, just like, the Antichrist. And he's going to come and he's going to have a tongue and he's going to be able to speak beautifully and people are going to listen to his voice and his wisdom and he's going to look handsome. He's going to talk about prosperity and he's going to get the attention of the people because he has those skill sets, those characteristics. So he continues reading. Verse 2, and the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard. So here are some of his characteristics internally, okay? Not on the outside. On the outside, he's going to look beautiful. Remember, Satan was the highest level angel ever created by God, okay? And now Satan himself is going to use the beast number one and the beast number two to can what? Control this world, complete domination. So it continues reading. This is some of the characteristics, the internal characteristics, which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear with the claws and the crushing power of his feet and his mouth like the mouth of a lion roaring. And then, of course, he will tear your flesh apart. Like Satan will tear your soul apart. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Who gives the beast the power and authority? The dragon. Satan himself is giving 
this beast and the other beast his authority, his power. Don't miss that. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. So one of these heads, figure it might be a nation, but I'm not sure exactly what this is. But check this out. And I saw one of his heads as if it were slain. It was dead. And his fatal wound was healed. So ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be like a resurrection here. Something was dead. And it was healed. And people are going to look at it as a resurrection. And it was a fatal wound. It was healed. And the whole earth. What did it say? About half the earth. About a quarter of the earth. About a third of the earth. It said the whole earth. Was amazed. And followed after the beast. Why were they amazed? Because it was dead. And it was risen again. It was healed from death. And the world was amazed by that power. This is the dark power. This is the evil power. This has nothing to do with God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. This is the dark side. And they have the power to heal. Who gives them the power? God allows it to happen. Okay. Verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. So now they're worshipping who? Satan? And they're worshiping the beast. They're worshiping two of the three right here in this verse. They're not worshiping God. They're not worshiping Jesus. The whole world is what? At this very moment, worshiping who? The dragon, Satan, and the beast. Because they saw this amazing healing. Okay, let's continue. So, Satan is getting... His, because of the authority he gave to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? They think he is so outstanding that they're worshiping him, and they're even referencing, now, who could even beat the beast? Who could? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you and I know who can. Jesus Christ. He's going to wage war, and he's going to take no prisoners. But at this very moment in time, everybody is what? Worshiping them. Verse 5. And there was given to him a mouth. So he has a beautiful mouth, a sharp tongue, going to be able to speak beautifully. And but in him a mouth speaking arrogant words of blasphemies and authority to the act of 42 months was given to him. The three and a half years. Okay blasphemies remember the abomination of desolation okay he's going to set himself up as what christ and he's going to blaspheme god and jesus and from the past and say that he is the true real christ with satan as god and that's where the blasphemies come from okay and for how long 42 months the great tribulation, the three and a half years. Verse six, and he opened his mouth to blasphemies against God, to blasphemy his name, his tabernacle, the temple, that is those who dwell in heaven. So not only God, but all those who would believe in such a God that had a son named Jesus. All of them is blasphemy. Verse 7, and it was given to him to make war. Okay, it was given to him. Authority was given to him. God is allowing this to happen for ultimately his glory later on. To see how all they're not, we, what, pass the test as well against Satan. So it says in verse 7, and it was given to him to make war with the saints. So the saints are still around at this very point in time. The believers, there's no rapture at this point in time. And it was given to him to make war with the saints. To what? To overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. That's powerful. So this is the last ruler as the world's going to know. Okay. And he's about to get everything that any ruler from past, 
present, the future would ever want, and that is what? World domination. He's about to be here at world domination. And ladies and gentlemen, how is that going to happen? Well, in this past election, we've seen how the media can control what people know and what they don't know. Okay? With the big tech, with Twitter, Facebook, Google, all of that, and all the national news network, you get one antichrist to get the media, and they're going to be able to tout that he is the true Christ. And no one's going to be able to go against him. So they're going to be able to funnel all this information to the whole world. And that's why the whole world's going to follow them. How far away? I don't know. But we did have just a glimpse of how powerful the media is. So we're going to pick it up in verse 8. All who dwell on the earth, all who dwell on the earth, will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world. Remember I showed you the chart of the three earth ages? Here's the foundation of the world. Before the beginning of time. It says, who name was not or has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. So the earth dwellers who choose to worship the beast instead of Jesus. This is why their names can be permanently taken out of the book of life. Because they don't know what is about to happen. Because they're not what? Biblically trained. If you know this is going to happen. Well when you see it. Are you going to understand what's happening? But if you don't know these verses. How are you going to prepare yourself? You're going to be one of the other dwellers. Who what? Worships the Antichrist. Okay. Verse 9. Anyone has an ear. Let him hear. Verse 10. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. These are characteristics that Jesus followers must have. Perseverance and faith. Strong faith. Faith enough even to say, I will die for my Lord, and Je my Lord Jesus my savior picking out verse 11 the beast the second beast from the earth and i saw another beast okay beast number two this is going to be the false prophet and i saw another beast coming out of the earth he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon he spoke like satan himself verse 12 and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. What is the false prophet's job? To lift up the beast so that all of us will worship who? The beast who was healed. That's the job of the false prophet. It's almost like, remember, John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus Christ? And he warned people, hey, look out, Jesus is coming, Christ is coming, okay? The false prophet is going to brag about the Christ, or about the Antichrist. He was healed from death, and he's going to lift him up. His job's not done. We're going to learn more of what he does here. Verse 13, and he performs great signs. So the false prophet is also going to perform great signs. So that he even makes fire come down out of heaven. Could be lightning, could be fire. But he's going to have the power to bring that down from heaven. To the earth in the presence of men. And they're going to go, ah, oh, unbelievable what I just saw. Of course, that's got to be the Christ. Not if you know the word. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. What's another reason how he's going to deceive the people? Because of these types of signs and wonders, which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. They're working in tan, in, as a team, telling those who dwell on earth to make an image. Uh-oh, another warning sign. Now the false prophet is telling the people to make an image of who? Beast number one, the Antichrist, to the beast who had the wound sword and come to life. 
Now we're going to have what? Worship to an image of the Antichrist. People who do this are going to what? Lose their spiritual virginity. Verse 15. And there was given to him to give breath to the image. Okay? Here's the power. Here's the signs. Here's some of the wonders. They create an image, and he's going to be able to give the breath of life to it. Breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast might even speak. And cause as many to not worship the image, the beast, to be killed. So this is powerful stuff happening. Verse 16. And he causes the false prophet, the second beast, and he causes all, the small, and the great, and the rich, and the poor, and the free men, and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand. Right there is a hit for God, because where's Jesus seated? At the right hand of the Father. Where did Jesus tell the apostles to fish off? The right side of the boat. Satan did it on purpose. The right hand. Okay? So now you have to have the mark. To give him the mark on the right hand or on their forehead. Verse 17. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. Either the name, the beast, the number of his name. Ladies and gentlemen, right here. This action is going to create martyrs or it's going to create traitors to Jesus Christ. Because if you love your life so much here, you decide to take that mark, you are now worshiping who? The Antichrist. But if you do not like your life that much that you're willing to die for your Christ, your Jesus, our Lord and Savior, right at this moment, then you'll be taken out, but you're going to go directly where? To heaven. Don't miss this point. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 660. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you to a couple of slides real quick, and then we're going to open it up for aha moments and questions or comments. So I'm going to show you a couple more slides. So right here, this is like a promissory note. Some of you know what a promissory note is, but the amount of this particular promissory note, what's at stake is eternal life. That's the wages here. And where's this going to take place? It's going to take place in heaven. And when can you take this promissory note and redeem it? Well, it will be redeemed at the time of your death, at the time of my death. When I take my last breath, God and Jesus are going to look at this promissory note. They're either going to accept me or reject it. And I'm going to take you. So I'm going to take you to Titus chapter 1, verse 1. And this is from Paul. Paul, a bondservant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God, and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. Verse 2. In what? In the hope of eternal life. What did it say? The guaranteed eternal life? It said, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So here's the promissory note. He says, you know what? I promise you an opportunity for eternal life with me. But there's conditions. What are the conditions of the promissory note from God? Well, the recipients must be faithful to the Father, our Creator, and the wedding groom, our Lord and Savior. The recipient must repent and ask for forgiveness from sinful behavior along life's journey on the road to salvation. Who holds a copy of this promissory note? Well, it's held by Jesus in the Book of Life. But Jesus on the bottom reserves exclusive rights to revoke the promissory note for breach of conditions. This is his promise to you and I. So I wanted you just to kind of see this and then back it up and document Titus 1. Everybody should write that down. So now we're talking about the road to salvation. When does salvation actually take place? Salvation takes place when we take our last breath. That's when 
Jesus will decide where we go, whether our name, whether or not our name is in the book of life. So here we are over here. We're born. This is the alpha and the omega of our personal life. We get on the road to salvation. We either decide to be what? Obedient to God's word, or we decide to be disobedient. Or sometimes we might be obedient, and sometimes we might be disobedient. Along our journey in our life, on our way to the road to salvation, our faith either will get stronger or weaker, or maybe won't even exist. And our love for our creator can increase or diminish or be non-existent. Okay? But in the meantime, we got Satan. We got all the e evil angels and the evildoers. And say we want, because our pleasure of our eye, we take a left turn over here. Because we want to pursue to worship idols. Or we want to pursue fortune. Or we go down the road a little bit further in our obedience, but then... I get weak in the flesh and I want to commit adultery. Or I just want to steal somebody else's stuff. Or I can take a right turn and go down here. And I want to commit murder. Or to worship other gods. Which is breaking the number one commandment. Or if I just want to be a liar. Or I want to pursue fame at the cost of anything, including my soul. But good news is. If you do take these turns, you can come right back here and start all over again on your pursuit to heaven or hell. But here, the redemption loop is available to all of us through what? Repentance and forgiveness. So even if we did this, can we go down here and go through the redemption loop? If we repent of our sins, what did John the Baptist tell us? Repent, 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 and turn back to God. Ask for forgiveness and sin no more. So we have the ability, right? But if you go right by this and you do not repent for this lifestyle back here, then what happens? Something to think about. So I wanted to show that. And I wanted you to see how easy it is. Now, I'm going to go back to the book of Revelation. What does God say about our journey? On the road of salvation question mark so this is from revelation chapter 21 verses 5 and 8 so god says this in verse 5 and he who sits on the throne that's god said behold i am making all things new and he said write for these these talk to apostle john write for these words are faithful and true you can count on them ladies and gentlemen verse 6 then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, this is chapter 21. There's only 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. So it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Verse 7, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's your inheritance. That's what's at, that's what possible. Verse eight, but for the cowardly, those who love their life here more on earth than they do for their eternal life, those who are gonna take the mark of the beast, the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and even the, all the liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Again, for your documentation, this is God speaking in the book of Revelation at the end of Revelation, verses, chapter 21, verses 5 and 8. So I got one more slide to show you. We know this is Satan's world. This is the world we were born into sin. We need Jesus to get to God's kingdom, to be born again. That's why he died on the cross for us, to be that bridge to get to heaven through him. But in Revelation chapter three, verse five, he, if you remember what he said, he said, he who overcomes will thus be clothed with the white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life. So if we journey down that road to salvation and we're obedient, and our faith continues to grow as we grow older in age. 
and our love for him grows deeper as we grow with age and wisdom by reading his word, then he will not erase our name from the book of life. And I will confess his name. This is Jesus speaking. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit does or what the spirit says to the churches. So does this mean that if we do not overcome on the road of salvation, will our name potentially be erased from the book of life? Something for us to think about. And the last slide, the question I want you to think about, we don't have to answer it tonight, but the question is, who does God say is ultimately in charge of your biblical training? He leaves it up to you. He leaves it up to me. He's not going to force us to eat the book. So that concludes our lesson. Chapter 12, chapter 13. Questions, comments. Yes, sir, Arnie. Uh, I just two little comments here. Uh, in verse five, of chapter twelve, where it says the child was caught up unto God and unto His throne, I believe that's referring to the resurrection. And, and there's we discussed this last night in our Bible class the night before last. That there are many, many uh, symbols of the resurrection in the Bible. Uh, one of them being Abraham thinking Isaac was dead because God said kill him. But then Isaac didn't get killed. It's kind of a symbolism of the resurrection. Moses thrown into a basket uh, and the Pharaoh's daughter raising him. Another symbol of a resur resurrection. The other thing I wanted to say is in verse 11, it says, uh, they love their life even unto death. Well, if you were truly following Jesus, you know that Jesus conquered death. And that he made only eternal life for those who believe in Jesus. So why would you fear death? It's death of the flesh, not of the spirit. That is true. That's yeah, true. And the reason the reason this is here as a warning for us is that because some people in this world, in this earth age, really, truly love their lifestyle so much that they don't want to give it up. And if you look at what happened, remember the conversation between in Genesis between Abraham and God and Lot was in Sodom. And God and, and two angels came down and talked to Abraham and said, hey, we're going to destroy Sodom. And then Abraham negotiated, hey, all the way from 50 down to 10. Well, if that you remember real... Lot's wife, if you remember Lot's wife got to escape. And they were warned not to turn around. What did she do? Yeah. She was afraid of the lifestyle she was leaving behind and she turned around and was turned to dust as a result. She lost her life because she loved, potentially loved her lifestyle in the city of Sodom. And if we love our lifestyle so much here and we take on the mark of the beast, then we will lose the eternal life. Go ahead. You know, he... Uh... Abraham negotiated down from 50 to 10. He should have really been the writer of the book of the deal. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Anybody learn anything? Howard, Howard go ahead, sir. Chapter 13, verse 8. Okay, I'm there. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Is that going to mean exactly what it says? That means all, ex huh? Well, you can you can look at it as being what literal or symbolic, right? You got oh. two options. 
look at it either way. I, I still don't understand. All, and it, it does that. It, it keeps on. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, however has ears, let whoever has ears, let him hear. But there, there have been a few other cases where it was very similar to this. It almost sounds like you have no choice. It says all inhabitants of the earth. That, if that's the case, then you don't really want to be an inhabitant of the earth at the end times. So, so it, it does look like, and, and I think part of the point here is that Satan is so good at deception that if you are not understanding the word of the Bible, you're definitely, the whole world, and if you look at our world now, you think biblical literacy is at its highest or at its lowest, have you ever seen it? So it's at its lowest. So those who do not know that this is going to happen, they're going to think that, yes, the Antichrist is the real Christ, and they're going to worship him. They're going to see these miracles, and they're going to go in there. Now, is it the entire world? I cannot say that. There's Obviously, there's a remnant, and we're going to be talking a little bit more on that in the next few chapters. So there are survivors. We do know that he cre created a, a place in the wilderness that is protected for Satan's, for Satan's. We do know that there are saints who are going to be witnesses to those who do not believe in the millennium as well. So, so the entire... I don't look at it as 100%, okay? So let's put it in percentage standpoint. I don't think it's 100%, but it looks like the whole world is following after him. Does that Harry, make any sense? Harry, Harry, oh. my Bible says something a little different. It says, and all that will dwell on the earth shall worship him. Every one of those whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. So if your name was written in the book of life at the foundation of the world, you wouldn't be worshiping him. I mean, the verse five, eight specifically says, everyone whose name hath not been written from the foundation. Well, Arnie, I, um, I, I concur with, your, with what you're saying. Uh, and that would be my feelings, that if your name is written in the book of life, it's written in the book of life. You're not going to erase it or uh, cut it out or whatever. Uh, maybe it's just that this translation here is not as written exactly like it should have been. I don't know. Well, it's like it's kind of like uh, when we were children, we, we couldn't wait for Santa Claus, but then we became adults and learned that there is no Santa Claus. Okay, it's we worship Santa Claus when we were kids, but then as we grow spiritually, we will worship Jesus. Well, there are other instances I I can't point them out right now, without going through and really studying it a lot more but there's other instances where it says that the beast was bringing fire down from heaven god brings fire down from heaven it's going to be pretty tough for a lot of people to believe that when the beast brings fire down from heaven it's not god bringing the fire down from heaven correct and there are just other examples that are very similar to that. That's probably one of the reasons why I've always been hesitant to read and, and to try and understand uh, the revelations because you, you're picking and choosing what you want to believe literally and what you want to believe figuratively. 
I don't think that that's right, that you can, that you can, I can't believe some things in the Bible as being literal, and then some things in the Bible as to being positive black and white, because you don't know which to pick and which not to pick. Doesn't that say study to be approved? Watch the signs throughout times, and it'll put this puzzle together for us. Well, we're going to need God's help to not, as a, as a believer, and assuming your name is written in the book of life, you're going to need a lot of help from God and the Holy Spirit when it comes time to believe uh, some of the things that are going to happen because it, it sounds like it's going to be really bad. It I'm is. Sure, I'm sure getting all the help right now. You I'm are sure. studying right now. He's yes. given you the ability to even ask the questions. And we have as a teacher and we have to uh, read and try to keep up with the times also. It's a book like uh, a road map. You start in Genesis and go to the end. Oh, and it well, does take a lot of study and a lot of love in your own heart to do it. Well, it takes a lot of power outside of your own ability I would think to believe some of the things that it's saying are going to happen as to whether they are happening when God allows them to happen as to uh, are these things happening because of the beast or because of God? God, God is ultimately allowing it all to happen. And and when I started when I started the, the lesson today, I actually said we will not walk away here with clarity. We will not walk away with a crystal clear vision of what's happening in chapters 12 and 13. And I said, let's not get caught up on some of the details of, of what is written and lose the big picture that God has planted for us. So the importance the important for us for, for us to walk away with is the knowledge that there's going to be what? Satan, beast number one, beast number two, and they're going to do everything that they can to what? Deceive the children of God, even the elect if possible. So with that knowledge and knowing some of the, the signs and wonders that they're going to do, we are going to prepare ourselves emotionally, physically, spiritually, to overcome. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we're never yeah. going to know all the details. There's too many no mysteries. Question. No question about that makes sense. Yeah. The, the, in my Sunday class, Sunday, Sunday school class, yeah, I asked a question. And that question was, why do you think God has told us everything he's going to do from the beginning, Genesis, to the end, Revelation. Why do you think he told us all the things he's going to do, but didn't tell us what we are going to do? And tonight, I think the question was answered by, for me anyway, and that is, he told us everything he was going to do so that we could keep our head down and follow that path 100%, not 90%. In other words, don't get lukewarm, stay hot and follow the path. Well, he's, he's not only told us what he's going to do, in a lot of cases, he's told us what he's not going to do. And... Uh, well, that's one and the same thing. That's one and the same thing. If he tells you he's not going to do it, that means he didn't do it. You know, it, he's going to do it. And uh, it, it just... It, well, what it he's going to allow... Yeah. It was difficult for me to understand. It's still difficult for me to understand a lot of the verses that I read, but it was difficult for me to understand why he would scare the hell out of us by having the book of Revelation. Okay, why would he do that? And it's kind of like, I remembered my dad said, you get, you're grounded, and if you go out one more time, your butt has had it. I mean, it's just a warning that you better... That's what, it, that's what it is. It's a warning to beware. Yeah. 
not going to be all tea and roses. Yeah. You need to be ready. You need to be ready, yeah. So, so there you go. So, so the warning is this, is that you must continue to build your faith on the road to salvation. And how do you build your faith in the road to salvation? Is God going to let Satan into heaven? No. Is he going to let somebody who worship Satan or the Antichrist or the false prophet into heaven? Yeah. No. No evil is going to. Did he allow, did God allow the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Yes. And ever since then, it's been our choice of how to make decisions in this earth, whether or not we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and be Christ-like or not. If we're going to be obedient or not. Because he says, if you're not going to live that way and you're going to be disobedient, right? Even the chosen people of Israel, did they make it to the promised land? They didn't make it to the promised land because they were disobedient and rebellious. If we are disobedient and rebellious, will we make it to our promised land, which is what? Heaven. Yeah. And that's the warning. That's the warning. This is not this is not me making a commitment when I'm 30 years old or 50 years old. This is a lifelong journey all the way to the end until I take my last breath. That's what he's telling us. So he's saying, he's saying to be prepared. He's giving you the instruction on how to be prepared. It's yes, like go to it's like go to Costco and get plenty of toilet paper. <laughs> and he gave you he gave you this love letter to help you in your preparation. That's why this made it for thousands and thousands of years. He's not only done that, he's given you the Holy Spirit. Amen. Which dwells where? Inside you. So actually God's inside you. But what do you have to do for the Holy Spirit? You have to surrender to it? You got to let it lead and guide and direct your life? You have to repent. Yes, sir. Was the, was the, the, the chart of the road to salvation, was that helpful to you at all in any way? It was to me because I got I saw that loop because I already passed most of that road. I'm 73 years old, so I was happy to see that loop. Okay, the redemption loop. Okay, repentance and forgiveness. Okay, so that was helpful. What about the promissory note? Was that helpful for anyone? Good. I like that. Okay. So. Between Tracy and I, we're trying to create items to help you see things a different way, a little clearer, and not get caught up in all the verses so that you can literally see, hey, this is what God intended. And so we're trying to give you some visual aids for that. Cornelia, you got your hand up? Or are you scratching? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. The only, other thing I, the only other thing I want to say tonight, Gary, is you know, the number seven is supposed to be completion and like it's supposed to mean something good. And yet they gave us seven dragons. Wonder why. Maybe they are good. Not all of them. Yeah. The number of the man. Six, six, six. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with the godliness, the spiritual completion. Number seven. Well, uh, didn't somewhere along where we read tonight give you the impression that Satan is in heaven also? He was. He was. He got kicked out, and and he got kicked out in these verses tonight. Okay. He was kicked out. Before okay. that, he was in the court of God Himself, having conversations with God Himself. God allowed it. And with a lot of the angels, too. A lot of the angels. Was he the angel of light? He is called that, too, because if you notice everything, there's an opposite. You got Christ and you got the opposite. Okay? 
Who's the light of the world? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. But who did you say he is? He's also he known is. as as the light. Morning star, morning star. Christ, antichrist. He is mirroring Jesus all along so that he can deceive those to follow him. He wants your soul. Everything, there's an opposite. There's good and there's evil. And he's trying to mirror everything he does, that is Jesus, in order to deceive us so that we will follow him into the abyss, into the pit of hell. And that's what's scary, Howard. The scary part about everybody worshiping it is because he's going to perform miracles and actions like Jesus did. Oh. And it'll be hard for man in his limited mentality to not understand that that is the Antichrist and that though he's performing these miracles, you have to continue your faith in Jesus. It'll be difficult for mankind because man's brain doesn't work you're gonna, that way. You're going to lose a lot of, of cold weather friends when uh, it comes down to that. It's uh, let's, let's well, just you say, and I, you and I, say, and all of you that are attending these classes, we won't be lost in the cold because that's we're learning in these classes, thanks uh, to people like Trent Perry, that uh, things that come, and so we hopefully won't be lost, even though our limited mental capacity is there. We've expanded it somewhat by reading the Bible and listening to these classes. So, if 80 percent of America or the world in general, do not know these verses, there's probably a 98% chance that they will follow these signs and these wonders. They will be amazed, as is written in the book. They will be amazed from these signs. And they will automatically think, because of their lack of biblical education, they will automatically think, well, that's got to be the Christ who's coming back. And then they're going to worship him. I don't know if it's 85% of the world or 95% of the world that do not know this. But they will be amazed by these signs and wonders like you're talking about. And they will then start worshiping. You know, it's really funny. I, I've been following here for a long time. I remember when... Go ahead. I remember when Visa first came out. That was the first credit card. Oh, that was the mark of the beast. You're going to go to hell if you use a credit card. <laughs> I mean, that's the, way, that's the way it was. And now it's the uh, injected disc or, or um, chip. You know, that's going to be the mark of the beast. You, you, I'm not going to get one. No, sir, I'll go to hell if I get one of them. And that's not what the Bible says. It's either 666 on the hand or on the forehead. That's the mark. But what I was getting to earlier, you mentioned earlier that there was a 30-minute darkness. You know, when I, when I worked for the phone company, we had generators in all the offices. And when the power went out, the generator would kick in. But no matter how hard you tried, when you switched back from the generator to commercial power, there was a, a blink. You think that was maybe when the power of light was switched from Satan to Jesus? I don't know. Could be. Could be. Make you think. Yeah. Well, Howard, Howard. You're old enough that you you were probably around during the resurrection, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Howard. I love you, Howard. <laughs> okay, so so look at look at it in these terms, right? Do we have all the answers? No, but we have enough knowledge through the Bible, okay? And we have enough real life knowledge. As I mentioned before, how does this happen? How can one person dominate the whole world? And be praised and worshipped. And that's when I was talking about the media. If one person really rises up and has that silver tongue 
and all the media comes behind it, the whole world is going to hear only what that person says. And they hear it over and over and over again, backed up by what? Signs and wonders and healing. And they're going to talk about prosperity, giving everybody a chicken in the pot, no student loans, whatever the case may be. And everybody's going to what? Follow them. So it will be eventually one kingdom, one religion, one world financial system. And whoever dominates that, according to the biblical prophecy, will be the what? Antichrist. Yes. Does that give you a picture as well? No. Terry? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for teaching this class. Because I will have to say Revelation has never been my book to go to. But I've learned a lot and I appreciate it. Okay. So fear is usually when you don't know something, right? We're usually afraid of the unknown. And what this is happening here is we're getting educated. And that should take away our fear. Because if we know what's going to happen, we can prepare ourselves spiritually and through our faith for it. And then we will become overcomers. Sure, it might not be pleasant, but at the end of the day, a little unpleasant, unpleasantness in this life versus the eternity with God himself is no comparison. It's no comparison. And that's why he said, do not like your life on this earth so much that you'll give it up for the eternal life. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm learning. I'm learning right along with you. No doubt about it. I enjoy it. You're learning how to mute people, I guess. So, any other questions before we close in pray, prayer? Because we got Christmas right around the corner, so we're not going to meet for two weeks, but anything else? Any aha moments? Are you going to meet next week? You're not going to meet next week, huh? No, Howard, we're not going to meet for two weeks, actually. We're going to yeah. take the next two weeks off because of the Christmas holiday. A lot of families coming in, other people going out. So we're going to take the next two weeks off. That's fine. Everybody else has got Christmas too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anything else before we close in prayer? Does anyone feel led to pray tonight to close it out? I do. Okay. I do, Heavenly Father. As we pause to think of our many, many blessings you've blessed us with, for answering our prayers, for giving us me a little longer on this earth. Help me to utilize every opportunity I have to say, Lord, have your way in my life and influence others. If they really want to be at peace, they have to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. And I thank you for Christians that we can pray with that we can express our feelings, our understanding of things. And this particular book of Revelation is a very difficult book to understand. And thank you for the opportunity to try to un understand a little more about it. But most of all, we want to stay close to you. So when you do call us home, we will be ready to go. Amen. 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 Thank you, Fran. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas to all of you and Happy New Year. I'm sure I'll see a lot of you in the meantime, but thank you for studying the Word of God. Thank you. May you give blessings to thank all you. of you and, and your family members. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry, Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. God bless you.